Wars aren't like TV. That's the, the hardest thing I think it is for the mind to comprehend. And you really see that what you're killing isn't the bad guy, he's another person. So I got on the plane, I left Iraq, I left the war zones, I left Fallujah City, the invasion. All the burnt bodies, people with missing arms, legs, half their faces, I'm gonna leave it there. It, it doesn't stay there, it doesn't not get on the plane with you. You're trying to put it into a box, a black box with chains, and you try and keep those chains locked instead of going to seek help. Something triggers it where that memory comes back. You can't unsee what you saw, but it's okay to be screwed up. It's okay, we don't have to hide it anymore. PTSD is not a disorder. PTS is the most normal response to the most abnormal circumstances. And there's an enormous stigma with mental health in this country. In America, when you look at the risk factors for suicide for our veterans, a lot of that stems from not being able to access mental health services early enough when they need it. I, I will still say in the military, and I've been, I've been retired for, for 10 years, you wouldn't dare say you had a mental issue. I can't go to combat, I can't take care of my friends, I can't cover their asses. Two, if you, if you came out, you're pretty much done in the military. When you're in service, there are still obstacles to self-disclosure. Uh, for certain career fields uh, of pilot, um, they cannot have a mental health condition. When we're serving, the public wants us to be healthy. And so people still hide their mental health. My husband got out of the Marine Corps and lost that identity and uh, wasn't sure where to turn. And it was easy for him to fake it while he was still within the service. But out of the confines of that camaraderie, and out of the confines of that predictability, that's when he started having some difficulty. You know, the system has failed them many times, so they, they build up a facade, they know just the right answers to, to give, so people will stop asking the additional questions. When someone reaches that point, uh, that, that's a sad state you know, for those individuals. The population that we serve at the Farmington Valley Health District is very high in veterans and it takes on average 10 years for a person to get help for an underlying mental health condition. When an opportunity for a grant from the Movember Foundation presented itself for us to really create an inventive and outside the square kind of program to work with our veterans and mental health and men's mental health, I jumped at the chance so Resilience Grows Here was born. One of the most humbling lessons that I learned as a professional is that I don't have all the answers. I can provide the trainings and I can provide the backup and the support, but a lot of the work gets done in communities like the Valhalla Motorcycle Group. The ones that come here, these young guys, they go to the wars and they hear through the grapevine about the barn because they're looking for another source. The first thing I will say is like, hey, you know, we're all screwed up, right? So they get in that relaxed mode, and then when they start seeing the walls on the faces, we start talking about them individually. That's when they'll break. And, and the beauty of RGH and taking that course was, it taught us, don't be afraid to ask those tough questions. And when somebody's in trouble, it's all about asking questions. You can't baby them. You can't coddle them. They're in trouble, you need to understand that you have to bring them out of that trouble. And the only way to do that is by being honest with them and 
moving forward from there. Because eventually when you bring down the wall, that's when you can open up to, to help. When you come in here, we're not saying lay on the couch and tell me how you feel. I've never asked anybody to tell me how you feel. Before they even got here, I already knew how he felt. I already knew what he'd seen. I already know what, where his mind is. I think that's the difference here. They go to a psychiatrist's office, and I'm not taking anything away from them because they're, they're very valuable. We try to get them to that level next. So when I met Ben two years ago, and he reached out to us about some suicide prevention training and peer support training, it suddenly became the natural alliance. So we build that trust in the people that we trust to take care of them, and we trust the RGH people. We screen who we work with, and we found RGH close by, willing to bend over backwards, because we're talking about somebody's life. We're not talking about a, you know, another paycheck for a job. It's somebody's life. Ben brought our son Larry's things home from Iraq, and so that's how we met Ben the first time. And he's come to support our family um, since Larry was killed. It's from his heart. He knows exactly what these men and women have been through. He's seen it. He has, he's seen it on the battlefield, and he's seen it when he's had to knock it on the doors to let families know that their loved one won't be coming home. And he has to be ready to jump out of bed and run. And he's so respected and so loved. He does it well. Lisa is the embodiment of what Resilience Grows Here is. Lisa's understanding and ability to talk the language of the families and talk the language of the veterans. This is a woman who has used the greatest personal loss to connect with the community. It means the world to me to help our veterans. Um, that's just my heart in, in taking care of them on behalf of my two sons who served, and especially my oldest son, Larry, who gave his life in Iraq. So when you look at small town America, there's something incredibly unique about how they live and work together. Everybody knows everybody. There are families that have lived in these communities for three and 400 years. It's got an incredible feel of connectedness. So for me, I look at my community as uh, circles within circles. So I belong to the 103rd, I'm an airman. Community is however you define it. Everybody in here kind of take on as my personal responsibility. Because as long as you feel like you belong somewhere, that's the kind of roots that keep you from hurting yourself even when bad things happen. There is a relief in understanding that this is not just them. This is not just the dirty little secret in their own family, that this is something that is a lot more common than we, we think that it is. I think the more people like myself and like RGH and the community that they have telling that story, I think we'll, we'll see more people raising their hand and saying, me too. Just to know that they have someone that they can call and they can count on, so that um, at the end of the day, when they lay their heads down on their pillow, you know, they, they have some hope. And I think that that is what Resilience Grows Here is giving them, is hope. DGR and Movember and their supporters really allow us to do this work that changes lives. You know, in less than two years, we've trained 2,000 community members in suicide prevention. And so there is an awareness that is blooming. Thanks to um, organizations such as Movember and the distinguished gentlemen and riders, we're going to make it happen. RGH can be a barn, RGH can be a field, RGH can be an office space. And one of the things that our RGH members tell us is it's like coming home. I know at any time I can call Justine for help. She's going to become embedded in a motorcycle world and having the RGH right here, which this is a high route for motorcycle rides, it's a win-win, you know, for everybody.